So today we're going to be talking about the role of open source at a company. And uh, like Inez said, uh, this is Dino. He's a security person, and I promise he's one of the good ones. Uh, he's hacked a Mac and an iPhone or two and written books about it. And he's also the co-founder and CTO of Capsulate. Uh, and they're this super cool uh, container runtime security startup. And I guess you all know Jess already, so there's not much else to say. But she knows a thing or two about open source, having worked on projects like Go, Kubernetes, RunC, Docker, and Linux. And I'm pretty sure at least a couple of those will be a big deal someday, so keep your eye out for them. Like, here's to hoping. <laughs> so you've made, let's say you've made a thing, and you're really proud of it. It's a special snowflake. It's your beautiful code that you've waited your entire life to make. And you want to share it with the world. And so the best way you think to do that is make it freely available, make the source available, make it so anyone can grab it, do whatever they want with it. And you have grand visions of uh, releasing it, that they'll, the threads on Hacker News will be glorious, appreciative, and civil. And <laughs> you, know, you start thinking about yourself as like, yeah, I kind of think of myself as kind of like Rob Pike and Linus Torvalds, kind of half and half. I think, yeah, I think I could really do that. Um, but the also part of you wonders, like, maybe this is like that party in high school where you're like, all right, if I throw this party, will anybody show up? Like, maybe it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, so it's pretty complicated, actually. And uh, yeah, if you ever get anything on the Orange website, uh, it's never great. So <laughs> the hard thing about this is that you have to open source a project that people actually want to use. Because a lot of the times, what's going to happen is these contributors are using their free time. So why would you ever spend your free time on a project when you could actually go outside and have some fun? So if it's not useful for a contributor, they're not going to spend time on it, and you're not going to be able to build this community that you want to build. Uh, and you also really want to get influential people involved. Uh, but this can also backfire in the fact that it will intimidate your new contributors. And this actually happened to me on the Go project. Uh, one of my first contributions, uh, the two reviewers that I got were Rob Pike and Russ Cox. And I was just like, ooh, I kind of want to duck behind my computer right now. So this can be scary for like everyone. It was scary for me, too. And so it's something that you really need to take note of. And you want to be welcoming to new contributors and make sure that they feel like they can be included, um, especially if they think your project is cool, because that's a huge compliment. Um, so uh, this gets like super, super complicated. Um, and you want to make sure that it's definitely useful. A lot of these companies will open source things that are actually not useful. They just feel like, we don't need this anymore. Let's throw it on the internet and see what happens. And that's not a great thing at all. So uh, how many of you remember when Mozilla was the about colon Mozilla page in Netscape Navigator, and it showed the cool like Mozilla, logo, Mozilla mascot, the, the dragon thing? Um, I do. And I also remember when that project was open sourced. And around, a little after that, James Winsky had a great quote. You can't just take a dying project, sprinkle with the magic pixie dust of open source, and have everything magically work out. Even if something is incredibly useful, um, an open source community might not just galvanize around it, because the code might be really difficult to get involved in understanding. Like the source code of a modern web browser is incredibly complicated. And it doesn't typically, and if it's just been dropped wholesale onto the internet, it's really difficult for people to get involved, even if they want to, because it's just intractable to understand, you know, where there's a lot of tribal knowledge inside an organization of how a code base, especially a complicated one, works. Um, just presenting it without clean documentation of each component makes it difficult to get into. So you have to actually make something accessible and make it useful, because if no one's going to, you know, they're mostly going to be volunteering their spare time or time from other projects that they could be doing at work to work on the project. And so if it's not worth their time, they're not going to just you know, come and take it to where it needs to go. So let's decide that you've actually decided to give away something useful, and it's accessible, and you might have another problem. There's a joke, may you have a successful open source project as an ancient curse, because it can be uh, a lot of work. And I'll let Jess tell you about what that's like. <laughs> Yeah, definitely a curse. <laughs> so yeah, I've been around the block in terms of large open source projects and getting a bunch of 
uh, burden from it. So maintaining a project and a community is hard, and they are kind of two separate things. Like your community is all about the people involved, and the project is kind of more about the code, documentation, and stuff like that. Um, so you really have to take the time and effort to build this out and you know maintain it. So. Um, on a lot of the projects that I worked on, uh, you know, people will come in with all their feature requests and everybody wants their own like Turing complete thing in your project and then you have to review them. And a lot of the times what happens is these maintainers kind of look at it as a, like cattle coming in because you'll have 50 pull requests to review in a day. Um, and so you're kind of responding like, uh, can you change this? You know, there's not much like a smiley here and there maybe, but it's very blunt. And you need to like keep in mind that these contributors, like this is a one off for them. Like, you see it as cattle, but this is like they're, you know, they spent the time on this and you should give them some time back to be like, thank you so much for your contribution and stuff like that. Um, and you also need a way to get contributors to actually level up to become maintainers. One, because it will give them a sense of ownership over the project and make them feel like they have more responsibility, but also so that the maintainers themselves do not burn out. Because if you, you don't scale the maintainers with your project, then uh, as your issues and pull requests like grow as a project, it will be nearly impossible for you to keep up with. And then there's a bunch of other processes that you actually have to put in place for your project entirely in terms of reviewing, uh, fixing vulnerabilities on the project, and then letting the community know that they need to patch their systems as well, uh, CI and testing for the project, um, this kind of leveling up process from contributor to maintainer, and then the roles of the project members themselves, code of conducts, and then governance, like how do you decide if a feature gets in or not, really, who has these like deciding factors. All these things need to be figured out. And it's not just like, you open source this project, here's some code. It's like, no, there is this entire processing entirely that you have to do along with it. So if we look at the container ecosystem and kind of the fire hose that they get in terms of pull requests, it's absurd. So when I look, worked at Docker, which is the green one here, uh, in around 2015, um, we had like seven or eight so maintainers, and we were going through 8,348 PRs in a year. Like that is a lot of pull requests. So when you think to yourself and you come into work in the morning at your like normal job and you say, you know, I have these three code reviews to do, we were doing like 200 in a day. So that's, that gets super, super hard to do. And if you even look, like Kubernetes is just out of control right now. And when I pulled the stats for this, I did it by organization, not by the actual project itself. So this encompasses all the uh, sub-projects of these organizations on GitHub, which is why the numbers are so large. So yeah, you definitely have to be aware of you know, how you are managing your project, and we all talk about scaling our infrastructure, but you also have to scale your project. So scaling your maintainers, scaling your reviewers, and scaling uh, contributors are an entire different problem on themselves. So in a lot of different projects, like especially these ones that I've worked on, you'll get companies that want to add their features to your project, and it gets a little iffy as to, um, you know, are they trying to make money off your project? Or um, like, what is exactly their incentive? Um, are they going to profit off of it? And are you like giving away your secret sauce, maybe? So you can tell by the black hoodie that I'm wearing that I'm a security guy, so I really care a lot about secret <laughs> sauce. I sort of think that every, every line of code that I write is secret sauce. Um, I'm sure you might know the type. Um, but so what we say you have a a uh, successful open source project, and it takes off like wildfire, and you're managing this community that is sort of like managing a large engineering department of people who kind of come and go at their, at their choosing, which sounds a lot harder than even managing a normal engineering department. Um, you have to worry if, are you giving away too much? Because if you're, you know, starting, a, if you're at a company, you have to make sure that there's still some value of um, what your customers would be or are paying you for. And it's very common also for us to confuse kind of our product for the software artifact. And I think a lot of people in this room know that you know, a lot of open source projects that we use sort of every day and don't even really think about that there's a thing that's not open source often, um, it's just because that's a more useful way to use it. It's more malleable, it's more flexible, it lets us 
Um, it just works with all the things that we need to do, and it speeds up that iteration cycle of the feedback from what is needed to solve the job and, um, and what the tool should do. But um, there's, so there's, you know, you have to make sure that you're still preserving the value of uh, the service, the commercial service or product. And for us in kind of security land, our subject matter expertise is, you know, core to that value. So um, make sure that there's still something there. Um, you also have to think about commoditization. So for instance, um, it's a common worry to, think, to say, um, are we commoditizing ourselves? Like, are we you know, making ourselves unnecessary? But maybe what's happening is that the world is commoditizing you anyway. Um, that what your product is is becoming um, just you know, freely available and there's many choices. So for instance, not many people think about selling a Unix operating system anymore. But I remember when there were so many to choose from, from different vendors, and now there's really not. Um, and so, the, the, so that's what you need to think about. But the, going back to the secret and secret sauce, your secret isn't all that secret. So going into some of the kind of nerd stuff, because you can see we've got a, also a black screen, so we're talking about security stuff. Um, you know, I know, I know our type. Um, so you, the secrets in your source code are really not all that secret. And when people, a lot of software engineers think about how do people go about reverse engineering, they think about the tools that they know. They think about, oh, maybe you just used you know, OBJ dump and just read the assembly. And yeah, I think you can figure something out from there, but it's really complicated and time consuming. But then you look at like the tools that are being built and people are using for capture the flag competitions and people are using for um, actually everything up to like car modifications. Um, it'll rebuild the call graph and function control graphs inside of the software and allow you to interactively rename functions and rename variables and then even have an interactive decom decompiler. So you can manually teach the, the decompiler more information about the software and get very readable source code out of it. So the only thing that you really, that is really secret once you've released a binary into the world are the comments and we all know that all the code that we write has plenty of accurate comments anyway, so <laughs> there's <laughs> it's not really much left. Um, so I, I encourage people to not worry as much about the secret sauce, and I've, but I've you know been on both sides of this, and this has actually kind of been a transformation for me because uh, was it maybe three years ago I was at Square and we decided to open source KeyWiz, our secrets management system, and I was literally I think the only person I was like wait. The thing where we put all our secrets, you want, we want to give that away, tell people, one, where all the secrets are, and two, how it works. Are we, are we sure about this? I, cause I, but it was fine. It was great. Um, and so sometimes you have to go, go you know, through those periods of hesitation and actually really think about it from a larger sense and worry that, re realize that your secrets aren't all that secret. It's not a big deal. You'll actually gain a lot from that process rather than holding back. So overall, we hope that you, you learn some things about open sourcing. And none of these rules necessarily apply to every single project, um, like I said, uh, especially like when I switched from working on Docker to working on Kubernetes, I kind of like ran in with the same ideas, thinking that they would work. Um, but uh, it doesn't necessarily apply because every single project is its own unique snowflake. Um, and every single community kind of works differently. Uh, but now you can know that you can open source your project and not you know, lose your secret sauce or feel super scared about it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And uh, keep your eye out for our open source offering. This is also a part of my personal exploration and growth in getting ready to do it. So thank you. Cool.